How's it going guys, Joshua Lefemi here live from LA and in today's video we're going to be hearing from one of my best bros, Sean Anderson. He's an extremely talented VFX artist, I've known him for like almost 8 years. He has a crazy cool project that he's going to kind of run through and break down in this video. Stay tuned. Sean, the floor is yours. Thanks Josh. Hey everybody, I'm Sean K. Anderson and not too long ago I created a cartoon about a wizard and his raptors. The whole thing was a metaphor about how the season went for my favorite NBA team. So this is actually less of a tutorial and more of an overview of how I created the cartoon. I used a lot of different pieces of software and plugins, but in the end it all comes together in After Effects. So there's definitely no one way to achieve something like this. These are just all tools that I've slowly learned over the years, but hopefully there's something here that you know gives you a place to start. And if there's anything you'd like me to dive into deeper, then just let me know in the comments. Okay, there's a lot to cover, so here we go. Brace yourselves. So in every shot we have five main things to consider the background, the characters, the weather, the lighting, and what I like to call visual accents. These accents are just the extra things you throw onto the final composite of your shot to help bring it to life and plus it just a little bit more. I'll show you what I mean in a bit. In addition to having a written script, when creating an anime cartoon, it's also important to have a storyboard. But remember, storyboards don't have to be perfect. In my case, I just created these thumbnail doodles and even used references in some frames just to get the idea across that I was wanting to convey. Ultimately, I believe that if you're the final creator of the piece and you're also making all the storyboards yourself, then you shouldn't spend too much time on these storyboards and instead save that creative energy for the final art. Rough thumbnails should do. Okay, let's start breaking down the first scene, the backgrounds. The background in the first shot is comprised of five different planes that shift as the camera moves from left to right in order to create a sense of parallax. These layers were each created in Procreate using the paintbrush strokes to give it an organic feel. Procreate is an iPad only app, but you might be able to achieve similar results in other software like Photoshop. Now, I'm no painter and I didn't create these from scratch. Instead, I actually found photographs online that best suited what I wanted to build for the scene. I then took those photographs, imported them into Procreate, cut them up and manipulated them into the shapes or layouts that I needed, and then used the smudge tool and manually created brush strokes over the layers. This way, you retain the shadows and shapes of what you're trying to recreate. The clouds, on the other hand, were created from scratch. Using the paintbrush tool, I created happy little clouds with a circular motion for each little puff as the shadow layer, and then white puffs on top. Mm. What a friendly cloud. In After Effects, I create a 24 frames per second composition and import these layers. Then layer them where they fit within the shot. Now for some parallax. The dictionary definition says, the effect whereby the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. In other words, for our purposes, parallax happens when the camera moves sideways and the objects in the background move slower than the objects in the foreground. To create the background's parallax motion, I attach each one to a null. I give them all the same in and out keyframes to start, then decrease the motion distance gradually lower from the front to the back. You could also get these results with a 3D camera if you're savvy with those in After Effects, but I find this way gives me more control. The next scene is layered and animated in a similar way, but the trees are actually some 3D models from Turbo Squid that I brought in with Element 3D. To make these different forest layers, in the Element 3D panel I randomized the size, placement, and rotation of just two different models for each plane. I created each layer for the scene and then applied the CC vector blur effect to give it a painted look. To make the foreground layer out of focus, I used a camera blur effect, which gives the scene some depth. The crystals in the last scene were also 3D models from Turbo Squid that I brought in with Element 3D. The stars were created using a template in Trapcode Particular. The characters. Drake the Wizard and his Raptors were designed and drawn in Clip Studio on iPad. Clip Studio is also available for desktop and Windows-based tablets and computers. Again, you can achieve similar results in something like Photoshop, but there's some features I really like in Clip Studio, so I'm sticking with that. Now, I'm not a great illustrator and have some pretty unstable hands, so drawing in Clip Studio helps me counter that in two ways. One, your pen tool can be stabilized as you draw. And two, you can create vector layers. I use vector layers for all my lines because it allows me to correct my strokes using the pinch tool rather than having to redraw it altogether. 
Also, Clip Studio has a fill tool that's really handy because you can add extra pixels to make up for the anti-aliasing of softened strokes, which can be a real pain when you're trying to color everything in, like it is in Photoshop. References are key to getting your art right, so make sure to source some type of visual reference for anything you're drawing that you're unsure about. In Drake's case, I had images on hand of Gandalf's staff and hand placement, as well as his hat, to get the body right. Same with Drake's face and the raptors. To animate the legs running, I set up a timeline in Clip Studio and animated them frame by frame, giving it all a cell animation type feel. For this, I set my timeline to playback in 12 frames per second, since traditional 2D hand-drawn animation is done at half the frame rate of your main timeline, or wherever you're broadcasting. Once you have a complete run cycle, you can loop it as many times as you need. For the frame by frame animation, I exported as PNGs and imported them into After Effects as PNG sequences. When importing, make sure the PNG sequence frame rate is set at the right speed. For the art that didn't have frame by frame animation, I export as PSDs to retain all the layers and brought them into After Effects. Importing the PSD files into After Effects creates a composition where I can do additional character animation to it. Retaining the layers allows me to break things apart, like animating pupils under the eyes from behind the face, and just gives me a chance to adjust things like color, shadows, or anything else I want to change within After Effects. Full flexibility. I set these compositions to 12 frames per second, and then in the Advanced tab of the Composition settings, I click Preserve Frame Rate when nested or in Render Queue. This will help keep the character animation in sync with the frame-by-frame -frame loops. So while the character animations are 12 frames per second, my main comp and backgrounds move at 24 frames per second. I noticed that big budget 2D animated films and 2D cartoon TV shows also have variable frame rates, and it just seems to work. In the industry, this is also called working on ones and working on twos. Ones meaning every frame, and twos meaning every two frames. I use puppet pins in combination with a free script called Duik. Duik is an incredible free inverse kinematic script that helps you to rig 2D characters. But for the purpose of this animation, I actually only use the Add Bones feature. We'll definitely talk more about Duik and other IK scripts and plugins in a future tutorial. With Bones, you can easily attach each puppet pin point to a null and use keyframes to give an extra level of movement to your art. I try to keep this motion subtle, since any great range of motion in this style of almost cell animation should be handled as new frames. But you can bring a lot of extra life to your characters with even the subtlest bit of extra movement. The weather. I wanted each consecutive scene to feel like we've really journeyed far from the first scene, and one way to distinguish each location is by the weather. In scene one, I created snow using Red Giant's trap code particular. They have a preset within that already, but I tweaked the size and direction, as well as the particle type, so it felt more snow-like. To add a bit of drama and extra depth to the scene, I added some fog and clouds and had them drift to the sides to reveal the tower that we see. These extra wisps of fog were just some light strokes I created in Procreate, and I layered them between each plane until I got the look that I wanted and the rain was created using the CC Rainfall plugin that comes with After Effects. The lighting. As we composite all the layers together, an important thing to consider with 2D animation is how everything is affected by the lighting. You have to consider time of day, shadows, and reflections. The more you incorporate this into your scenes, then, like I've said before, the more you bring it to life. With your 2D art, you want to add in the shading where necessary in the software you drew them in. Generally though, with 2D animation you don't see a lot of shading on characters, so don't feel like you have to go crazy with this. To get the shadows of the character on the ground, I was able to get away with flipping the art, making a solid color, and reducing the transparency until it looked right. Keep in mind that the color black isn't always the best option. For the snow, I actually tinted it slightly blue. As you can see up close, the shadows aren't perfect, but this was a corner I chose to cut, and I don't think too many people noticed, right? If you noticed, you get 5 points. To get water reflections, I also flipped the art and added some blur and distortion. For the side shot, I used the ripple distortion, and the sailboat shot, I used turbulent displacement. Adding glows and optical flares to objects that emit light is another way to help composite things into your scene. For the tower light, I used the optical flares plugin by Video Copilot. I added some glow effects to the crystals, I used trap code shine for the spirits in the sky, and I used the inner shadow layer style for the lighting on the close-up shot of the characters, with the blend mode set to lighten. Finally, make sure to use color effects such as curves to blend all your layers together and make sure they look right in the scene. I actually used this to change the brightness and tone of the characters as the edit cuts from scene to scene so that the lighting looked right for each setting. Accents 
Once you have all your pieces in place, it's time to look it over and see what kind of extra accents you can add. For the opening shot, I actually used some assets from the Scribble Accents pack that I created, which is available to purchase online. Scribble Accents is a pack of hand-drawn scribbles that you can use to add a bit of flair to any edit. Use it in travel videos, music videos, animations, and vlogs to plus it up. This pack has over 100 drag and drop assets, available both in HD and 4K. And to create titles like the ones I've been using in this tutorial, download the Scribble Fonts pack, also available. In the opening shot of the cartoon, I used the Breeze asset and slowed down the clips by 50% to bring it down to 12 frames per second. From here, I pre-rendered the entire edit before adding the final touches. In a new comp with my pre-render, I added layers of film grain using the Film Grain Builder Pack that I created, also available to purchase online. With Film Grain Builder, you get a truly modular film grain setup that you can dial up and down as much as you like using drag and drop layers. There's grains, dust, burns, scratches, hairs, flickers, mud, vignettes, and even templates that have pre-made looks with all the layers already laid out for you. You can give it that dirty, grungy, drag through the mud look or something more subtle and cinematic. With over 50 assets to lay over your footage, there's an endless amount of combinations and possibilities. To get my look here, I used the 60mm 9x16 template and dialed things down into my final look from there. In a few different frames, I also used masks to add a bit of film damage. I really wanted this to look like it was something that could have been made in the 80s. Then, to get a subtle RGB split look, I took the pre-render, duplicated it twice, set the two top layers blending mode to add, then use the set channel effect to set each layer as red, blue, and green channels. To do this, turn off every channel that you don't want the layer to be. Then label each layer as such. Pro tip. Renaming your layers is very important. Too much work you say? Who has time to right click every layer and rename? Well, a quick way to go about this is with the return key. Simply select the layer, hit return or enter, rename your layer and hit return again. To quickly shift to the next layer, hold onto command or control and down. And now with that layer selected, you can rename it too and continue on to every layer. That's right, every single layer. Or Krampus will come after you. Okay, final step. To get the split, you need to nudge the top layer just a frame to the left and the second layer a frame or so to the right. There, RGB split. And that's everything. Again, if there's anything here you want me to dive into deeper, then just let me know and maybe I'll unpack that more in another tutorial. In the meantime, make sure you follow me at Sean K. Anderson on Instagram and make sure you like and subscribe and I'll see you guys next time.